Hello and welcome back to the wisdomfactory.net and this is the series conversations that matter and today I talk with Kimberly Spite and she has done another of these pioneer works. She has spoken with 100 people and uh, the book came out and she called it what I need to, to know about you. No, but before we talk about <clears throat> your experience, I invite you to say something about you. Oh, first I have to say I'm Heidi Hanlein and I'm <laughs> sitting here in Italy and I have founded the, the Wisdom Factory together with Mark, who is not here anymore. And so I have to do it myself. So, but that's all about me. And now to you, over to you, Kimberly. Well, hi, Heidi. Thank you so much for having me on your program. I'm really excited to be able to, to share with you a little bit about the journey that I took about a year ago. A little bit about myself. I am uh, a mom. I am a wife. Uh, I'm prior military service. And uh, I started on this journey really because right now I work with uh, senior executives in the military who are transitioning out of the military into the civilian world. And as I was helping them in that process, I always talk to them about the importance of networking and how their network is often where their help is going to come from. And so when they're transitioning, a lot of times they move from their current location to a new location. And it's really important for them to be able to get connected into their new community. So I talked to them a lot about networking and then I realized that they needed some more help. So I started to, to teach about a two hour block on practical steps to networking. And as I was going about that, I, I came across this idea of meeting 100 people in 100 days um, from a conference that I went to. And I thought that would be a perfect challenge for me because then I would be able to share with them not only the practical steps, but I'd be able to say to them, if I can meet 100 people in 100 days, then surely you can go out and meet 15 or 20. And so that's how I started this journey. So it was a real challenge which you took on. And how did you manage really 100 days? <laughs> and hundred people. That's a lot of, of work, first of all, to get into contact, to establish the, the schedules. I know what that means. So you were full-time uh, occupied, I guess, with that. So you are muted. You have to unmute yourself. <laughs> okay. So actually, I was still working at the time, and there were days where I just had to say, all I can do today is I need to go and meet someone because uh, it, it was quite a bit of a challenge. It wasn't so hard to meet people because I love talking to people, love uh, meeting with people. The challenge for me a lot of times was actually the writing of the stories, to honor their stories well, to steward their stories well. Uh, so the writing part actually was part of the more challenging aspect for me. Um, but I, I met people everywhere just as I was going about my daily life. I just had to be very intentional about having conversations. Um, a lot of times we, there are people that come across our path all the time and we just, you know, we maybe just say hello and just pass by or maybe don't say hello. So what I decided to do is just be conscious about not only meeting people, but having intentional conversations. And then I had friends that helped me because my friends knew that I was taking up this challenge. So they might say, Kimberly, I want you to meet such and such. And then they would, you know, they would make that connection for me. And that helped a lot also. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> so was it in person, the meetings, or were they online? All of the meetings were face-to-face -face, uh, because I wanted to be able to have that real connection with someone. Uh, so even if we set up an appointment on, you know, by the phone or through email, then the conversations I had were always one-on-one. -on -one. That's, that's great if that is the possibility. You know, I'm living here far away from everybody, so I have only online to meet people. And I have to say, I'm very happy about that, that we have technology, that you sit so far away over the pond. <laughs> and we can talk together. Isn't that great? <laughs> That's right. Well, I, I have to be honest, I'm getting used to doing more of the Zoom and video chats. Um, so as I get more comfortable with that, I'm sure this, because you and I have met this way, actually a couple of years ago, we met this way and that, that has worked out really great. So that would be a way for people to come into contact with others, meeting them through opportunities such as this. Yeah, 
Beautiful. So what actually did you talk about? How did you structure the, the, the conversations? Did you have a project, I mean, a plan, what questions to ask or how did it go? So it, it, it would vary. It would vary on how I would meet someone. Um, one time I was at, at, a, at my church and I walked into the building and there was a lady leaning up against the wall and she was just kind of, you know, she was cold and I had just come in from outside and it was, and I was cold. And so we started talking about the fact that we were both cold. So a lot of times having a conversation is starts with maybe something in common that you have with someone. And so that's how that particular conversation started. We bonded over being cold. And then, you know, as we got to talk a little bit more, then I told her about the project that I was working on and asked her if she would be interested in participating. And then she was, she was uh, very gracious uh, to accept that. And so then in that particular case, we set, decided to set up a coffee. So I met her at a coffee house and then we were able to have about a two hour conversation about the things that she wanted to share with me. And I would start out a lot of my conversations I would start with, you know, tell me a little bit about your background, for instance. Um, where are you from originally? So I live in Austin, so I would ask them, are you from Austin? And depending on their answer, either yes or no, we would go from there. Um, I would ask them things like, um, do you have any brothers or sisters? Uh, you know, what did you do after high school? Because most people go, you know, graduate from high school, but then people take different paths after that. And then I would start asking open-ended questions. But that's how my conversations would generally start, just with some of the basics, um, and then asking open-ended questions. Like, what did you do after high school? And then that would give them an opportunity to share with me whatever it is that they wanted to share. That brings me to the question, who were they? What age group, what uh, gender, uh, only women, men and women, or whoever? Uh, who were these hundred people? <laughs> That's a great question. It was literally anybody that came across my path that maybe would smile and show that they were friendly. So there were, there were young people. Uh, the youngest person I think was in high school. Uh, there were older people. I interviewed or chatted with people that were in their 80s. There were both men and women. Uh, I would meet people at the grocery store. I would meet people at a coffee shop. Um, in particular, I went to the grocery store one time just because I hadn't met anyone that day and I said, I need to meet some people. So I went to <laughs> our local grocery store just for that reason. As I was walking down one of the aisles, there was a gentleman coming in the opposite direction. He had this t-shirt and it said, it was a blue t-shirt with white lettering and it said Cape May. Now, I live in Austin, Texas, which is a long way from Cape May, New Jersey. But I'm familiar with Cape May because I grew up every summer going to Cape May, New Jersey. So when I saw him with that t-shirt on, that was a, a bonding, a connection for me. So I said to him as we got closer, I said, uh, are you, are you, have you ever been to New Jersey or are you just wearing that t-shirt? And he told me that he had actually been to New Jersey with his wife on vacations and that started our conversation. So we started from there with a the commonality. And then I shared with him the challenge that I was doing, and he was willing to participate, and so we had a great conversation. This is really great, you know. How I imagine, I'm just thinking a little bit, as we women normally have a little bit a problem with showing up and going out and doing things, this is a challenge to, to meet people, to, to overcome the hesitation uh, maybe for being rejected and then stay away, but find a way to connect with people. And I imagine, as you were telling me these two or three stories now, that people normally are not so against it. They normally open up when you do it skillfully. And skillfully means, as you said, find the commonality and then go from there, you know. Right, and people give, people give off cues all the time as to whether they're open or not. So one of the things that helped me decide who to ask is if somebody was smiling, then that said that they were friendly. And so if I made eye contact with someone and when they smiled, I'm thinking they might be open to having a conversation. Like when I was at a coffee shop, it, here we have coffee shops where there are individual tables and then there's uh, communal tables. And that means like multiple people are sitting at a table versus off in a corner. So I would sit at a communal table because that said at least people were open to other people sitting beside them. And 
if they smiled, then I would just, you know, I'd smile back and maybe start the conversation from there. But if somebody was, you know, looking down or avoiding eye contact or sitting off in the corner, then I didn't talk to them because I figured they weren't open to having that conversation. So people are sending off body cues about whether they're open and friendly all the time, but they just may not be aware of them. Yeah, um, the thing is, uh, people are open and friendly, but maybe if you were like this, they wouldn't be, you know? So <laughs> it depends very much on how you are sitting on this table, you know? So I, I guess you were very aware of that. <laughs> yes, it's really interesting because my husband used to always say, he goes, Kim, you get a different reaction from people than I do. And, but my husband generally doesn't walk around with a smile. <laughs> And so I said, well, I don't know what I'm doing any different than you. I mean, this was a couple of years ago, but I did learn going through this challenge that the smile really makes a difference. And in a, in a warm, genuine smile, a lot of times people will smile just from the, the lips down. Just, and it's kind of like a not genuine smile. But if you have a really great smile where it re reaches your eyes, your eyes start to crinkle, then people get that feeling of warmth from you. And so just picking up a few of those cues, my husband now, it's so funny because we'll be in an airport and I turn around and I, you know, maybe I'm off doing something different. I come back and he's having a great conversation with someone now. And it's because he's starting to smile more. So it really does uh, make a big difference. I was on an airplane coming back from one of my, uh, one of my work engagements. And as I, I was sitting on the outside aisle and a gentleman was, was needed to sit on the inside by the window. And when he approached to say that, you know, he needed to get in, he was not smiling at all. And he just seemed very business and matter of fact. And so I let him in. And then I had the thought, you know, after he sat down, I was like, should I start a conversation with him? Or maybe not, because he didn't seem very friendly. Well, I figured we were going to be there for at least a couple of hours in our plane flight. So I thought, well, I'm just going to take a chance. So I, you know, I decided to start a conversation. So I just said, you know, how are you doing? And, you know, and then, you know, he responded, but he still wasn't necessarily overly friendly. And I just pursued that. Um, so yes, I, I guess I stepped outside of my comfort zone and just, but I was at this point in time, though, I had been used to doing it. So <laughs> it wasn't as intimidating for me. Um, but he started to warm up. And then it was funny, because as we got into our conversation, he's actually from Africa. And, um, and so he was new in America, he was here um, going to school. And one of the things he said to me is, I'm not finding people to be very friendly. And so I said, well, are you smiling at people? <laughs> so, uh, so he wasn't aware of that. Maybe he was sending signals to people that he didn't want to be bothered. Uh, but I had a delightful conversation with him. He's a one. In fact, we're connected now on Facebook. We've continued the conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's really interesting how just getting past that initial roadblock and just for me being willing to step outside and go, I'm just going to see where this goes. Um, we, we've had great conversations since that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's wonderful. And what I'm also hearing what you are saying is that you can practice that. You said oh, you're not so afraid anymore. You had already experience with it. And so you could go on despite the first reaction wasn't so overwhelming, let's say. No? So you just insisted. Did you follow an intuition? Uh, no, I think because I had already been doing this journey now, by the time I met him, I had a lot of practice with doing it. So I was just going to see where that was going to go, whether he would be open to it. But I will say that about 20 days into my challenge, my husband looked at me one night and he said, Kimberly, you've changed. And that kind of caught me off guard a little bit. And I said, well, I thought I should circle back with him. I said, was the change in a good way? And he said, yes. And what he was telling me was that he said I had a lot more confidence about myself and I was a lot more uh, willing to engage and it became, in his words, more or less effortless. So I guess initially it was a little bit of a challenge because I had to say, okay, I'm going to meet this person. But after doing it about 20 days, it just became second nature. And anytime I saw somebody, if they were looked friendly, I wanted to have a conversation. So it does, it does become easier as you practice. Yeah, we, everybody can learn it. And the people who feel lonely, they could begin to start to practice it, no? So I can share also an experience. When we started with Mark to do the first radio shows, we were so nervous and still very tight. And so when the friend of us said, yeah, yeah, you can practice a little bit and then it will be better. <laughs> 
and then I mean we did so many shows at the end and it was it became easy and it was fun to interact together and to interact with the uh, with the guests and I have to say I always am so ignited how do you say illuminated after I talk with somebody when we stop talking I will be again you know that's for me it has become a um, big part of my life of my social life also because otherwise I would sit alone here with my animals and so on no? but to exchange with people and face to face it's just ah, <laughs> wonderful better would be as you said in 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 person but better this than nothing and we yeah. still have the feeling to to meet each other i always had the 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 experience when i met people in person whom i had known via video that was like i had known them forever so maybe i was astonished that they were short or high or something <laughs> like this but that was the only thing <laughs> We crave connection. That's one thing that I did learn through this journey is we all crave connection. And I think what a lot of times when people are down, they tend to want to isolate themselves and that becomes a danger. And yes, sometimes you might need to for a time, but I think to stay isolated, uh, just it's not a good thing. I think to make yourself get out there and meet people. I work from homes a lot of times, so I have to make myself get out and engage with other people. But I do, like you were saying, I feel so much better. I feel energized having some of those conversations. And then you grow. You grow a lot from the conversations because you learn a lot about other people and about experiences that maybe you've never had yourself just having those conversations. Yeah, and as you said, you grow and you 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 become more self-confident. And I think we women need to become in a good way self-confident. Not like, you know, like trying to be better men or something like this, but um, relying on our own abilities, innate abilities, and, and find out that we can do things. So, <laughs> beautiful. Yes, I think you're right. There's a difference between being overconfident or... or yeah, versus just having that self-confidence, there's, there's a difference there. But I think as we get out and talk to more people and we realize that we are actually more alike than we are different, then it does help us to have that sense of confidence that, oh, they're just like me. That was one of the things that I learned uh, going through and talking to different ones is that when, you, when they, especially if they went through something that was really challenging, challenging a, a, maybe a significant emotional event or a loss of a loved one, um, a lot of times they can feel like they're going through it by themselves. And I think as you have more conversations with others, you realize that other people are going through challenges. They may not be the exact same challenges that you're having, but they have challenges in their life also. So it's not, you're not a victim so much. And so I think that helps to then feel like you're included in the bigger world that, you know, there are great things that happen at times. There are not so great things that happen at times. And we all experience those and to be able to share that with other people and, and when you're going through a hard time, for somebody to walk alongside you in that hard time, it makes that burden a little bit a little bit easier to carry. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So I'm wondering if you could tell a little bit about what you found out in these hundred uh, conversations. Was there a line, a common uh, theme or, or an insight you had? I think the common theme that I, I, I found was that we do want to connect and that we're not so different. Um, it's interesting because I would talk to people, just most people were within 15 mile radius of my home, um, but then even when I would travel and I would run into people, I would have a conversation. And I think the common theme is that um, we all have encountered some hard times. And what I found is, those, is that when people were willing to open up and not isolate themselves, that it was easier. The hard times were still hard, but they were, if they were able to get through them. I, I found that most people would, at the end of a conversation, would say to me, thank you so much for asking me about my story. And that's what I took from that is all of our stories have value. Um, a lot of times it's the entertainment people or you know, people in, in athletics that they get to tell their story. And so we know about those famous people, but all of us have a story and all of us have something of value that we can share and that we can contribute. 
and that when we're able to share our story with others, it, it also makes us feel good about ourselves you know, just to be able to share and to actually maybe take stock in some of the things that we've done and some of our accomplishments ourselves. So I think it's a win-win for the person that's sharing the story and also for the person, the recipient, hearing the story. And I think which is also very beneficial if people have the impression that they are listened to, that you are really interested in what they are saying. Because normally it happens that you say something and the people are somewhere, you know, they don't really, including doctors, when you try to tell them something, they immediately give you a recipe and you have to, oh, how do, is it called, a prescription, and you have to take a pill and that's the end without really listening to you, you know. And so you, so hit on key, life too. you hit on a key point there, Heidi, and that's, and I, and I actually, I just cut you off, so this is, <laughs> it's listening, right? So taking the time to listen to what someone else is saying, to really hear them, to really engage with them versus just saying, hi, how are you? And then really not intentionally listening to the answer. So I think we can do that all the time is just walk by people and just say, hey, how are you doing? And just keep walking versus how are you? And actually pause and really, really listen. So I think you're exactly right. Even worse is how are you? How are you? And then start to tell them well, to the other people, you know, just use this uh, question for being able then to throw out their own stories instead of first listen. You know, I think this is a sort of a cultural phenomenon today that we don't listen to each other. And that's why so many, in my opinion, so many, not only misunderstandings, but mis um, situations are in the world because nobody listens from private people to politicians, to parties, no, nobody listens to each other. It's only mine is important and yours, you know. So I do think that we could change um, society or our way to be together if we learn to listen again. Well, again, I think you hit on another great point there. Um, as I was going through my, my journey, one thing I realized, was these were strangers that I was meeting. But I was able to have conversations about politics, about religion, the things that people say you don't have conversations about. And the reason that was is because I, when we'd have the conversation, I was listening to connect with them and to hear their point of view and to kind of, and a lot of times the people I were talking to didn't look like me. And so to hear their perspective and their experiences to understand where they were coming from was very valuable. And then what happened as a result of that Heidi, it was, it was amazing because then, then they wanted to hear my perspective. They would say, well, what do you think about this? And I could, we started to have those intentional conversations about tough topics, but it came from a point of not just trying to get my point out there, but to listen to the other person first. So then I really do want to hear what it is you have to say. And it's not that we always walked away in agreement, but we were able to at least understand the perspective that the other person had and to be able to honor that perspective. So one of the first people I met in my challenge, and this was a, a very fascinating story for me, uh, his name is Joel. And I met him at a co-working space. I had just gone up there to meet my friend who was the owner and she introduced me to Joel. And I told him about my challenge and he was willing to have a conversation with me. One of the first things he said to me was that my one of my ancestors died at the Battle of Franklin, so in Franklin, Tennessee, fighting for the Confederate Army. And then he followed up and said, I can honor my family's heritage without carrying their flag. So that said a lot to me right then and there um, that I need to understand where somebody's coming from to understand their perspective, what's shaped their ideologies, and then not to prejudge because he was a big, big burly guy with a big beard and just as gentle and um, we had a wonderful conversation. We talked about politics, uh, but I would have never had that conversation with him had I not stopped to ask. And I would have just made all kinds of assumptions about him, not knowing his past. So I thought that was a very valuable lesson for me. That would be, um, you would need to teach that to how to speak with one another, because what I, often uh, realize that people 
um, when you say something, then immediately they say, no, 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 but it's like blah, blah, blah. And I did that too, time ago, you know, until I realized, oh, that's not good. But when, then we enter into this confrontation and into the polarization. So we, we, the need to contradict what the other person said, because you think it different uh, immediately, you know, and that stops our conversation and makes out of it, makes a fight. It's no conversation anymore. And I have decided I don't do these conversations anymore. If I begin to be prompted to fight with somebody because of their getting in, then I say, stop, I don't talk about this anymore. And I, I'm, I'm practicing that now. I mean, it's not easy either. But that leads me to the other question. A part of having written the book, do you think to to expand on that, doing courses or something on that, to help other women to do similar experiences? Well, I, I would certainly encourage anyone, uh, and, and I, I guess I say to people, don't feel like you have to meet 100 people in 100 days. If you would just say to yourself, I got me 15 or 20 new people, right, maybe in two months, the whole idea is just to start meeting people. So uh, I do now speak on um, networking, which is relationship building. So I do that as a keynote speaker. So I do do that. And, you know, down the road, um, I actually, I, I have um, worked with people one-on-one -on -one coaching them as far as networking or relationship building. So it might, I might develop some type of course in the future, uh, but I do speak on that. And if people want coaching on that, I, I do that as well. That's a good notice. So people have to connect with you. <laughs> Oh, nice. well, so, I wanted to also share with you because when you were talking about, um, you know, where people have different opinions and they just start to butt heads. One other thing that I, I did notice as I was going through my challenges, I was talking to a young lady who had a totally different approach to life than, than my approach. And I found myself, as I was listening to her, in my head, I had to say, just stop and listen, try to understand where she's coming from. If this is a concept that is so foreign from my values, and then to think about why do I have the values that I have? What form those values? Are those values still valid? So it was really a growth process to really say to myself, how am I coming across to other people? Because when somebody says something to you that maybe it takes you out of left field, you might have a reaction on your face that would say, I don't approve. And that's not necessarily good. So, uh, and of course, the things that we're, I'm not saying we need to approve of everything. I'm just saying when you're, when you're trying to understand where someone else is coming from, it's like you have to you know, kind of think about the thoughts that you're having and try to figure out why am I having these thoughts and is there a different approach? And, you know, because I still want to value the other person. Even if we don't agree, that person still has value. Um, and their perspective is, is as valid as mine, maybe just based in, you know, different beginning. And so maybe I need to understand that process. It doesn't mean that I have to agree, but I, I did find that very, very interesting. This is um, one of the big insights, no? that uh, Ken Wilber said, nobody is uh, smart enough to be wrong all the time. That means some piece of truth everybody has. And if we take the time to listen for this piece of truth, we might even learn something. <laughs> you know? That's also what Jordan Peterson says. He says, listen to people, even if you don't agree, but they might, they might know something you don't know. So be curious and listen to them without needing to defend yourself immediately. Oh no, that's all shit. And today this um, communication tactics to to attack people, call them names, and when they have a different approach to, to whatever, that's not a good way. That's not creating peace. That is creating war. And now we have another war, you know, beginning. I, I don't think that's the, only the, the, the um, to blame the, the politicians. I think this is the overall habit of people not to create peace in their own lives. And then the politicians and so on, they, they take it over and they are humans like us. And I think we have to start with ourselves to create, create peace in, with ourselves and with the people around us. And then we can blame others. <laughs> 
Yes, and I think in our conversations, if we are trying to connect with others um, versus if you start name calling and, and just pointing the finger, it causes people to, to shut down and not hear what you have to say. And then it creates a lack of trust. And when you don't trust someone, then that's where you start having all these conspiracy theories and, oh, they're out to get me. Versus sometimes it's a matter of if somebody says something and maybe you didn't understand exactly what it was they said, what they meant. So if, so if you ask them, well, what did, when you said this, what did you mean by that? To try to understand then what their intention is. I think that can help people come down off of a ladder of maybe being so high and so, um, you know, angry. It can help people calm down and just understand maybe, maybe there was a misunderstanding that you could just resolve pretty quickly. Um, but yes, I agree with you to get away from the, the name calling and, and just the meanness out there. And I think, you know, even with uh, a lot of our social media, it can be really great, but it can also be not so great because people can't understand the intention behind some of the words. And also people can hide behind, you know, when, when you're not face to face, they say, well, I can just say whatever I want to say. Well, words, words can hurt. Words do hurt. And so I think to be very intentional with the words that we say to each other can go a long way. And then again, if we don't understand what somebody had said, like you and I were just communicating before we actually went on, on uh, the tape here. And you had said something that I couldn't understand exactly what it was that you were saying. And, and we could have had a whole conversation with, you know, starting from a point of not understanding each other versus saying, well, wait a minute, when you said that, what does that, what does that mean? Can you explain that to me? So I think that can help our conversations a lot. That, that is, would be the right tactic to, to talk together and ask if you don't understand. And as you mentioned, social media, I really do hate it. And um, I still post our shows on Facebook and it's no wonder that it has not so much response because I really don't like Facebook for the simple reason that you said already, people hide behind their words. And uh, often there is a um, sort of war, word war going on there and uh, <clears throat> people attack each other and then it goes down the rabbit hole of the conversation and oh no. And I think already when people are on video together, they would behave a little bit better. <clears throat> but behind words, you can, you, you can say everything because you don't have to look the other person in the eyes. So you, you lose a little bit of the good education uh, when you are angry. You are not so much um, in, inclined to control your own emotions and to ask the questions, which you said uh, before, no? What has it to do with me? Uh, you know, maybe my values, uh, maybe I should question them a little bit. Maybe the other person is right, you know? When, when you are just typing, that doesn't exist. You sort of write a, 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 a book and who knows who the uh, receiver is, you know? So um, you're doing a monologue, I think that's it. A monologue against the others. While when we are talking together, at least we do a dialogue. <laughs> right, and, and I think a lot of times even to the about social media, you know, hurt people hurt people. And I think a lot of times people are coming from a place of pain and, and they lash out or maybe they're fearing that they're going to lose something that they thought they had before. And so they're fighting to keep it. And so I think even sometimes even understanding that perspective that somebody might be coming out forcefully because of a hurt or a pain can help the other person then say, well, maybe I don't react to that. You know, maybe let me take a couple of minutes to take some deep breaths before I respond or think about what it is, you know, that's going on. Because I think you know, once people get angry, people, they, like you said, they just, they say things that are on the top of their head and they're lashing out. And, um, and if you were to have a conversation one-on-one, -on -one, then the chances of that happening, um, you know, it could still happen, of course, but the chances are decreased. So, but I think just, like I said, to be careful with the words that we, that we choose to use. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I fully agree with that. And hopefully we can learn that as, a, as humanity and, you know, resolve the, the, the problems we have, not with fighting, but with understanding and allowing the others to have other ideas and try to collaborate and co-create 
to come to a solution because if we fight against, we will never find a solution or a solution which is can even be worse <laughs> than, than the problems themselves. So um, it's not a good idea. But coming back to your, your book, tell me a little bit about also how the, the process was of writing and the stories which were most impressive to you. So the process for me was very interesting. Um, I, I didn't start out actually with the thought in mind that I was going to write a book initially um, when I first decided to take up the challenge. But one of the things I was doing is I was going to post, I told everybody I'm going to post it on Facebook. I was going to use Facebook to hold myself accountable. Um, and then what, for, for me, then the process was I had to get a story out um, pretty much every day for the 100 days. And so I had that time crunch. So a lot of times when people are writing, if it's not this type of a project, they have days and days to write. But for me, I had to write a story every single day. So that was very challenging because I have to have a conversation with someone. And sometimes, Heidi, it was anywhere between, I would say, 10 minutes to three hours, depending on how I met someone. So if I just met someone when I went to the gym, it might be a short conversation because, you know, it's like that person was at the gym to work out, I was at the gym to work out, and we struck up a, up a conversation. So maybe they had something else that they needed to do. So I would respect their time. I'd only ask for a little bit of time. But if somebody, you know, if I met someone and we had set up an appointment, then that meeting might take a couple of hours. And so depending on, you know, that we, I had the time to have that intentional conversation, a real conversation with people, then I would come home and I'd write the story. And then after I would write it, you know, you get very close to it because you've had the conversation. And, and also I'd have to say, if it was a challenging conversation because they had experienced something really traumatic in their lives, I would sometimes need some time to process through it before I would start writing. So it really depended on the story that I encountered. And I would also say, I never knew when I sat down across from somebody what their story was going to be. I couldn't predict, oh, this person's young, their story's gonna be all light and, and uplifting, and you know, or this person is going to you know, be very deep. I never could predict the type of conversation I was gonna have. Um, so then after I had that conversation I, and I would write the story, then I was very fortunate. My husband um, would read my story and he could give me his perspective, which was very valuable for me. Um, and I realized that very early on when I had written one story and he said, Kim, um, as a man, I don't know that I would want to share this out in the world. And so what I found is that people, when you're having those intentional conversations, people will share what's on their heart, but it may not always be something that you want to, if you're gonna put it out in the world, you may not wanna put all of those details out there. And so I would have to kind of go through and say, is this, what, in this particular part of the story, would it be helpful to someone that's reading it? And is it helpful to the person that told their story? So if it's not helpful to the person that shared that and it would not be helpful to the person that would read it, then I thought, well, maybe that part of the story, would you know what I'm saying? So it's like, I, I really try to steward someone's story well, to be truthful in their story, but at the same time, um, being conscious of the fact that it was going out to a public domain so it wasn't just a one-on-one -on -one conversation and so i wanted to uh, to be careful uh, about that so i tried i tried really hard um, in that light so that was the first i guess the initial part so i would have the conversation write the story i would have my husband read it and then we would my husband and i would have this <laughs> we'd have a dialogue i will say it was a dialogue about what i would keep in and what i would take out because not only was it uh, was it valuable, it was also the way that I would write it. And so as a writer, you tend to own that. It tends to become, you know, a, a, like your, not your child, but it's a part of you that you've written. And then to have someone say, oh, well, that's just extra details that I don't need, or I don't think you said that in a great way. You take that, you start to own that personally and you start to defend why you said it the way you said it. So that whole writing process was very interesting and uh and my husband and I were still, still have a great relationship so it's just amazing <laughs> to go through that process with him um, and so then after that 
Uh, I did hire some professional editors, so it's gone through the professional editing process and where it got chipped away again. Um, and then I would go back and after the editor would make a comment, I would have to decide whether I agreed with that or not. And I, I really wanted to keep things in my own voice so that as I was telling the stories, it was in the person who was telling the story was honoring their voice, but also my, my, my voice as the writer. I wanted that to come through as well because I wanted the book to feel very familiar with people, very like connected, a way for people to connect with the story. So I didn't want it to feel sterile. So it was a very, very interesting process, I will have to say. And I have just finished um, the complete editing process. So it's getting ready to start with the printer now. So it's been um, the journey and the writing initially was um, was the, the 90 days or the 100 days. It was 100 days of the challenge and 100 days of the writing. And then it's taken me several months since then uh, to actually get it to the point where it's ready for the printer. So it's a pretty involved, proce involved process. How does it feel now? <laughs> it feels pretty great. <laughs> I, I was joking with some friends and I said, I feel like, you know, having had two children of my own, I said, I, I feel like I'm getting ready to give birth again. <laughs> because it has taken, uh, actually this is a little bit longer process, because right now, um, I'm at, I started in September of last year. So this is October now, and I'm expecting the book to come out in December. So I'm thinking this is about a 14 month process. <laughs> So it feels like it feels like a huge accomplishment. It feels it feels pretty good, and once it actually gets out there, I'm excited to see. Um, I'm excited to see the impact. My hope is that it will impact people in a way that they will want to go out and meet more people and have more conversations. And and also in retrospect, I also realized that. Uh, because I was talking to people as I learned about my life, which is what I encourage people to do. Um, I also realized, though, that there are a lot of different people from different cultures that I did not get to capture in my book because of where I live or the, the things that I was doing during that time frame. And so um, I think for myself, I, now I'm curious about other, um, other cultures that I didn't capture in terms of just even expanding my understanding of, of us as, as people. So uh, it, I feel pretty good, but I feel like there's still work, more work for me to do in that area. Okay. So I think we will uh, publish this conversation with you very near to the, to the coming out of the book so that people can at least pre-order it, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so could you just which story did you like best or which was most impactful for you, which was most moving for you? Can you give us an example? That's a hard question because there were so many stories that moved me. Uh, I was inspired by, by young people. I was inspired by their their not just optimism, but but it was like why not? You know, when I would ask them, uh, this one particular lady, I met her when my husband and I were having breakfast. She was our server, and she liked to do a lot of trails and hiking. And she had injured herself, so she was take she was in Austin because she was taking a break from the trail because she had to you know earn some money and and just heal a little bit. But her goal was to go back on the trail. And and when I was asking her about why she was doing different things, she said, well, why not? And that was a profound statement for me. You know, why not? When did we stop asking, you know, as you get older, uh, or at least for myself, I stopped asking, why not? You know, you start going along with, well, this is the way things are. You know, I have a family. I've started down this path, and I have my responsibilities. And not to say that we should not have, you know, take care of our responsibilities, because we definitely should. But at some point along the line, uh, you, I lost the, well, why not try this? And I, I think for me, for myself personally, I got it back after my children had graduated from college and then you maybe go through that process of creating, that was my purpose and now what's my new purpose? Uh, so I think I started to get a lot of that back and try new things, but I think to have someone actually verbalize that to me in a conversation, that really hit home with me that that's kind of a process that 
I think a lot of people go through me. When you start out young, you think, oh, I can do this or I can do that. And you have different paths that you can take that are out in front of you. And it's like a blank slate. And then as you start going down one of those paths, then, you know, you kind of get settled into some type of routine and you stop, at least for myself, I stop asking some of the why not. And so that was a revelation, I think, I mean, just having that conversation. Uh, and this young person, she was in her early 20s. And so, you know, I learned from, I learned from that interaction, you know, to question why not, why, if I have this thought of doing something, I think we should evaluate it, but don't just discount it. So I think that was a very enlightening conversation. That was one, but I mean, I've had so, so many great conversations. I had another conversation. Let me just uh, fit in here a moment, because I think when we are getting older, then the why not can come back. We are liberated from the expectations. We cannot lose anything anymore, you know, a job or something because we behave differently than it is expected of us. And so the why not can, can come back. You know? I agree. Yes, I, I totally agree with that. Because like you said, you, you've met some of those responsibilities and now maybe you have that room to open up and go, I would like, where, where, what's my purpose, right? I think everybody, as I was going through this challenge, everybody is looking for their purpose and meaning. And as you finish one phase of your life, like maybe you've now raised your kids if you had children, or you've finished that one, that first career or whatever, I think people are still going, well, what do I do now? What's my purpose now? And so that's where I think the why not can come in as people are searching for meaning and adding value. Exactly. And I want to tell people that we are doing in the Wisdom Factory the Conscious Aging series. And there are some of the why nots there too. <laughs> okay, go ahead now with the other story. <laughs> so another story that really um, caught me off guard, I will say, is um, so I'm, I was telling you earlier how I had met a, a friend, she's a friend of mine now at church because she was cold and I was cold and we bonded over that and, and I sat down with her and, and she shared her story, which was a wonderful story. And then she introduced me to a friend of hers that I had seen before and I'd had a, a surfacey conversation with her before, but it was a very cold conversation. It wasn't very long and I had preconceived some ideas about who this person was. Well, when, when uh, my friend Priscilla introduced me to her, her name was Vicki, she and I sat down at a coffee shop and we had a three hour long conversation. And, and she is an amazing woman with an amazing story. And, and her story is, um, it's one of, of overcoming some very hard, hard circumstances. Um, you know, for instance, she lost her, do her daughter um, in a tragic car accident. And I learned so much hearing her story as she related, um, you know, told me about her daughter and, um, and just what it was like to go through that, that uh, to go through such a tragedy and then still be able to find hope on the others. You know, it, it takes time, but to be able to come to a point in life where there still is joy. And um, she had, she actually had a second marriage and in her, with her second husband, his son was going through an illness, cancer, and they lost him to cancer. So she's lost two children. Um, but to talk to her, she has such, such a life about her, such a joy about her, and she's, she's still, I mean, it's not like you get over, you don't ever get over the loss of a loved one. It just, it becomes different, your life becomes different. But she was also able to share some resources to be able to help others um, and, and, and walks alongside others. So just to you know, be able to be privileged to hear her story. Uh, she had me, I was crying at times, I was laughing at times. Uh, she's such a dear person and her story has impacted me and I'm sure it's gonna impact others as they read the story in the book. Um, and also to find out about resources that might be of help to them if you know, they are going through something of that nature. Um, but the stories just really touched me profoundly. Yeah, that uh, seems to be an experience that people who are going to, through hardship, then when they come out on the other end, they have the possibility to help others then. 
because when they have elaborated well, you know, there are also the others who become uh, eternal victims. Too bad for them because it's a horrible life and you are your lifelong, for instance, uh, I know people that who even after 15 years still uh, cry for their husband every day who, who died. I mean, prolonged grief disorder is certain, certainly not good for your own life. I mean, we have to go through, through the grief and I just did. <laughs> and now I lost four cats, <laughs> two in the same time, uh, in the same year. That's, it's not easy when you put your heart in, in a being, in a living being, but, you know, keep staying there. It's not a good idea for your own life. Then you give up on your own life. And I do think that we are meant to, to be in the world as long as we are to do something <laughs> and not to just, ah, 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 to, poor me, you know, I don't think that's why we came. <laughs> so. Right, right. And, 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 and there's so much that there's still left to do, but now you, you, you develop, there's a different um, sense about you, a different awareness, having gone through, you know, uh, such a, um, a heartfelt um, encounter, I guess. I, I mean, it, it just, it, it really gave me a different appreciation also. Um, yeah, I, I guess it just it just um, made me really appreciate the people in my life. And I guess, you know, that, I mean, that wasn't the only story. There were several stories like that and where I would encounter people who had gone through something. And um, it just really gave me a different appreciation and, and to appreciate everything that we have today, right? The people that are in your life, because we can miss the today's blessings. If we stay, um, if we stay in a, in a depressed state or a state where we're not appreciating what we have, that's in our lives today. So, um, I it, it, I just had so many enriching conversations, and to be able to for people to share their experiences, and then there young there were young people that uh, you know just had such this zest and willingness to give. Uh, I just grew so much. I think just being able to experience other people's lives and the things that they shared with me. It was, it was fabulous. So I just really encourage anybody out there in your audience um, to, you know, get past the, I don't know if somebody will like me, um, how do I have this conversation? Because the more that you get out there and you just talk to people, the easier it becomes, the more you realize that people are people. We all have at the core the same uh, values that we want to be valued, we want to contribute, we want to love, we want to be loved. There's so many commonalities that the differences really are not that huge. You know, I'm not gonna say we don't have differences, but then to be able to understand, like I was saying earlier, where somebody's coming from, appreciate them, you don't have to agree with them. Um, but I think life, your life will be much fuller. I know my life is much fuller just having had these conversations. Yeah, that leads me to the question, did you write down your own story? Oh, very interesting. Okay, so I, I have, did not write down my own story in this book. I have shared parts of my story. <laughs> As a speaker, I have done that. Um, and I have written down, I have written down my story in terms of, I kind of looked at it at one point in time in uh, four quadrants, and so I divided up the number of years that I've been alive by four, and I said, okay, so what was going on in that first, you know, first fourth of my life, and what about the second fourth, and so, and I did that throughout my life, and, you know, having done that, though, I think that's value added for anybody to go back and reflect on, you know, where have I come from, and what are some of the challenges that I've encountered, what are the great things that I've encountered, um, because in retrospect, things that I was going through at the time that I was going through them, even the hard things, I can look back and be thankful um, about the experience um, and see how I grew through the experience, even though some, some very painful experiences, but I can see on the other side that I survived, I got through it, and I grew as a result of it, and I can be thankful. I can be thankful um, for the di even a different uh, an aspect of, of whatever it was. Um, so for instance, I, you know, I, I lost my dad when I was 35 and that was a very, very painful experience because I was very close to my father. I was a, a daddy's girl. Um, but one of the things that helped me, I think, 
process through that was I was I, I started to reflect soon on after he had passed that the reason the pain was so great was because I had a, I had a great relationship with my dad that he loved me I, I was well loved and I loved him and so looking back on that I was able to be thankful to the pain I was able to be thankful because I had that experience so I think as I look through my story looking back on the different aspects and with thankfulness has really given me an appreciation um, for the life experiences that I've had and also going forward to be thankful each day for what I have. And so I think it's given help me with that perspective, uh, perspective of being thankful. I hope that I Thank you. Yeah, that's exactly also my experience with the death of Mark. It was not nice that he left so early, but on the other hand, I was really thankful that I could have had these, this different relationship with, which I had with him and that I had the years with him because all the previous relationships were all like, uh, uh, not really, no? And with him, I had some really deep felt heart connection and I could have gone from this earth without ever having had that, you know? So I, I, at the same time with the grief, I was grateful that I had him. And I think that really helped also to, to overcome it and to, to, to not lose uh, enthusiasm for life, <laughs> let's say. And Heidi, when you say that some of the other, even the other relationships though, you grew as a person, right? Even if they weren't the, you know, the best or whatever, but that, that experience, that encounter, that time in your life, you can look back and be thankful on how it helped you to grow as a person into the person that you are today. So I think, you know, even just looking back on whether it's relationships or whether it's um, circumstances, um, hardship, great things that happen also, how those all become a part of who we are today. And then and, and I'm kind of happy with, <laughs> it's taken me a while, but I'm kind of happy with who I've become, not that I can, I can still grow, but to be happy and, and, and I guess be content to be content with who you are as a person, to love yourself, I think um, goes a long way in terms of also what you can give then to others. So I think all of our experiences, you know, help us become the people that we are. And if there's something that we don't like about ourselves, we can change that. We don't have to stay at that level or with that, that aspect that we want to change. We can change it. Exactly. We have the power to change what we don't don't like and go into what we call shadow work, you know, to see what is there and maybe sometimes even laugh about it when we <laughs> discover that we are doing the same old stuff again. But being aware of it, what what is going on and co coming into the appreciation of, of what the sta stations, do you say stations, the steps in our lives, which at the time were maybe painful and difficult, but then they have brought us here. I mean, I cannot imagine people who have never had any challenges. That must also be boring. <laughs> anyway, I think uh, we could uh, also end with this note, what you said to people. Go out and say it again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go out, you don't have to go out and meet 100 people in 100 days, but if you can go out and meet 15 or 20, it's say in two months or three months, I think your life would be different. I think you will have grown. I, and I think you'll find that it's easier. And maybe then you can go out and meet another 15 or 20. So just put it down into bite-sized chunks. But I think you will, um, I, think, I think you'll find that you're pretty pleased with the outcome. Yeah, wonderful. And maybe your husband or your friends will say, oh, you have changed to the better. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much and uh, see you another time. That was thank great. You. And people, buy the book as soon as it is out, you will be inspired. <laughs> thank you, Heidi. It's been a wonderful opportunity to speak with you today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.